Somebody once told me all Shrek games are below me. A thought that really made me quite sad. The film was kind of fun back in 2001 and there's no way all the games could be that bad. Well, Philip started playing and he couldn't stop playing. He wrote a whole script and now he wants paying. Doesn't make sense why they made this junk. His brain's confused by how much they stuck. So much to play, so much to hate. Why'd we think a rank list could be great? Why'd we decide to rank the games? From the worst ones to the good ones. Okay, usual ranked rules apply. So light an earwax candle and get some snacking bugs at the ready because it's time. Let's rank them. I'm Ben. And I'm Peter from Triple Jump. And here is every Shrek game ranked from worst to best. Number 36. Shrek Fairy Tale Freakdown 2001. Game Boy Color. It's unlikely that Fairy Tale Freakdown was the first Shrek game to enter development that was almost certainly the Xbox launch game titled simply Shrek. But Fairy Tale Freakdown beat it to market, making it the first officially released Shrek game and a chilling glimpse at things to come. For starters, the title contains the word Freakdown. Why don't you use Freakdown in a sentence? Go on. YouTube provides a comment section for this precise reason, so get to work. And secondly, it's a one-on-one -on -one fighting game without a two-player mode. In 2001, there was no excuse for that, unless it were an act of mercy on the part of developer Prolific so that fewer people would end up playing it. If you've never heard of Prolific, that's not surprising. They made basically nothing. And if you're going to name your company Prolific, do try to make something more than basically nothing. The game doesn't look great as it's the Game Boy Color, so fair enough, but it controls horrendously with movement being both stiff and unresponsive. You start the game with six characters and can unlock three more if you hate yourself enough to finish the game. Being as you can't use any of the characters you've unlocked in combat against other actual human beings though, their presence on the roster will only serve as a sad reminder that you had nothing better to do with your time than 100% Shrek fairy tale freak down. Alone, while everybody else in the world was having fun. Hope you enjoyed it though. Number 35. Shrek Bingo. 2006. DVD. DVD games are necessarily limited in their interactivity, with just about all of them boiling down to glorified menus. Bingo itself is limited in its interactivity, as the main skills involved are sitting and not dying. Combine the two in a DVD bingo game and you end up with something so limited in its interaction that it threatens to permanently dismantle the very concept of interactivity. Now put Shrek in it! Shrek Bingo is basically a recording of a Mike Myers impersonator saying letters followed by numbers. It's like a novelty GPS, but without any potential use whatsoever. In fairness, you can swap him out for impersonations of three other characters, who also say letters followed by numbers. The game is both embarrassingly slight and massively overcomplicated, with the how to play tutorial requiring around two and a half minutes of explanation. For Bingo, a game so simple you don't even have to play it. You might think that there's value in having what is basically an automated bingo caller. During a child's birthday party, for instance, you can sit 30 kids in front of the TV and have them mark cards while a Shrek alike speaks numbers into the void. That could have been a nice, passive activity. Except that, according to the Amazon reviews, parents who actually tried this ended up having to keep pausing and restarting the DVD because Shrek barrels through the numbers too quickly for the kids to keep up. You had one job, Shrek Bingo! Well, now you have a new one rotting in a landfill. Number 34. Shrek 2 Ogre Bowler 2004 PC In 2004, Wild Tangent released a game called Polar Bowler. You'd pull back a gigantic rubber band and fling a polar bear in an inner tube at some pins, just like in real bowling. It was the sort of thing you'd boot up for a quick game, lose interest in well before that game ended, and move on with your life as God intended. Why am I talking about Polar Bowler? Well, because the same year, the same company released the same game as Shrek 2 Ogre Bowler. Granted, they did a bit more than that. They coloured the polar bear green. Am I being too harsh? If so, it's only because they didn't even put enough thought into the reskin to call it Bold Ogre. 
which is unforgivable. Surely they added more than some Shrek models though, right? Well, according to the game's official download page, yes, you can still purchase the game almost 20 years later, Ogre Bowler allows you to relive one of the most captivating and heart-tugging movies made to date. That's high praise for Shrek 2, but I'm not sure why they think the film is about a bowling tournament. Much ink was spilled at the time over Wild Tangent using its games and other releases to spread unwelcome, insecure code that gathered and leaked personal information. Ogre Bowler was less a quick cash in than it was an attempt to get careless children to install slyware onto the family PC. Maybe don't visit that download page after all. Number 33. Shrek Super Slam. 2005. Game Boy Advance. The other versions of Shrek Super Slam took heavy inspiration from Super Smash Bros, but they also added the ability to move around in three dimensions, giving the game some personality of their own. The Game Boy Advance version, however, limits the action to two dimensions, which technically brings it closer in line with Super Smash Bros. It also, however, introduces a unique feature of its own in that it's really terrible. In Super Smash Bros, with very few exceptions, you can see what all characters are doing at all times. That helps to maintain the sense of chaos and also provides you with all the information you need to decide what to do and when. In this version of Shrek Super Slam, you can't even see all of the stage hazards, let alone what other fighters are up to. Getting familiar with the levels boils down to repeatedly taking damage from things you couldn't see until you manage to remember where everything is. The fighting is rudimentary. Some items pop up now and then, but the fights rarely amount to anything greater than four people huddled together and punching each other. A Shrek fighter has fun potential, but this version of the game does nothing with that potential other than squander it. Of course, many of its problems come down to the innate limitations of the hardware, which is completely fair. Then again, we have to wonder why they bothered to try and get a version of the game running on it in the first place. Number 32. Shrek, Ogres and Dronkies. 2008. DS. One might expect that if anyone could have given us a great Shrek game, it would have been way forward. Not only are they known for their own excellent IP such as Shantae and the Mighty Games, but they've carved out a niche as a reliable developer of licensed titles. DuckTales Remastered, Batman the Brave and the Bold, The Mummy Demastered. The company knows how to handle a license while still making a game worth playing on its own merits. But for some reason, they gave us Shrek, Ogres and Dronkies, in which you babysit the children children of Shrek and Donkey. Why do you babysit them? Does it matter? We weren't even sure if we should mock the game by calling it Nin Shrek Dogs or Shreking Mama, so just go with whichever wordplay you enjoy more. You don't so much raise the children as you do keep them occupied, which usually boils down to lobbing objects in the hopes that they will take some kind of interest in them. Sometimes you'll get to play mini games, which take advantage of the touchscreen in the sense that they don't work very well due to the touchscreen. Every so often, the children soil themselves and you have to change their nap just in case you ever played any other Shrek game and wondered why can't I dispose of his children's fecal discharge. It's an unexpectedly glitchy game as well, with the children failing to react, actions failing to trigger and minigames not working as promised. You know, and I really hate to say this, but I'm starting to think that the developer's heart just wasn't in Shrek, Ogres and Dronkies. Number 31. Shrek Swamp Fun with Phonics 2002 PC now, I'm not one to judge people by how they look, but as Shrek is an ogre and not a person, I'm going to state very firmly that I don't want anyone who looks like this to teach me phonics. And I admit that I might be fighting a losing battle. According to the back of the box, kids love Shrek and it's easy to see why. He's big, he's green and he loves to read. Yes always reading. That's clearly Shrek's appeal. And if you misheard that as sex appeal, that's on you. And yes, I know he reads at the beginning of the film. Lots of characters read in films. That doesn't mean that loves to read becomes a defining character trait. And do you really want to throw down? Fine. Okay, he reads in the Christmas film, but it's a four idiots book. And when I see people with one of those, I usually conclude that they don't love to read. What was I saying? All right, Shrek Swamp Fun with Phonics. You're really going to make me talk about this, aren't you? It's an edutainment game, something Shrek of all characters characters should probably be nowhere near. It's a platformer, mainly. You manoeuvre Shrek around as he tries his damnedest to keep his face hidden from the camera and I can't blame him either. You'll need to grab certain letters, identify words that start with certain letters, work out where certain letters fall in the alphabet, you know, just like school except that there's no chance of accidentally learning anything. Number 30. Shrek Swamp Fun with Early Math 2002 PC the edutainment games start coming, and they just don't stop coming. There are probably a few subjects at which Shrek excels and might be able to teach, like which mushrooms are safe to eat. 
Yeah, I don't know actually, even that I'd probably be better off flipping a coin. Regardless of which topics Shrek might theoretically understand, early math doesn't seem like it's one of them, as colours and shapes are two things he seems to believe fall under the umbrella of mathematics. And yes, geometry would fit, but this isn't geometry. This is, here's a room full of squares, find the circles, and I refuse to accept colours being a branch of mathematics unless you accept that my favourite colour is 11. The eagle-eyed among you will no doubt have noticed that this is basically the same as Swamp Fun with Phonics. In fact, most of you who are only listening to this video and haven't even looked at it will probably have noticed. It's basically the same assets with very, very small tweaks to the objectives. Swamp Fun with Early Math has a slightly broader selection of material, even if much of that material has nothing to do with what the game is ostensibly teaching you. If you disagree and think that Swamp Fun with Phonics should be ranked higher, then fine. I agree on the condition that I never have to think about either of these games again for the rest of my life. Number 29. Shrek Dragon's Tale 2006 V-Smile. The VTEC V-Smile needs no introduction. I'm joking, of course. We covered it in our list of every console ranked from worst to best, and I've already forgotten about it. It was one of VTEC's many education focused consoles, with this one looking especially like a Fisher Price Panini Press. The library had a massive number of licensed titles, which no doubt pleased everybody. Parents could be satisfied that Batman was teaching little Johnny and Susie about basic sentence structure as opposed to beating the Joker to a pulp with his own leg. And kids could be satisfied that they got to watch. Shrek waddle around between lessons. And waddle he does, slowly, with about two frames of animation making him look like an abandoned flipbook. You'll waddle all around the world, looking for other characters who ask you basic exam questions or send you on fetch quests, which involve answering additional basic exam questions. The educational value is a bit dubious. The game isn't really teaching anything as much as it is requiring children to demonstrate that they already understand the material. On the bright side, the game looks terrible, but not as terrible as it could look. And it has voice acting as well, even though the actors clearly recorded individual words and phrases that the game pieces together into complete sentences sentences, making it sound like the characters are still learning English themselves. Wait, was I supposed to be listing positives? Who even knows? The game also lifts compositions from the Legend of Zelda games, believe it or not. They seem to have been re-recorded, but they are the same songs. I'll tell you one thing Shrek has taught me. There's no justice. Number 28. Shrek the Third, Arthur's School Day Adventure, 2007. Bee Smile. It's another edutainment game, this time involving Shrek and his chums heading to Worcestershire Academy to track down Artie. According to the product description, you will learn classifications, patterns, logic, spatial sense, basic math, and more. All of which is to say, it's up to you to locate somebody on the campus, and you'll accomplish that by completing basic quizzes and playing mini games. Are you not edutained? It's also the only Shrek game or edutainment game to open with Shrek skateboarding down a long empty road while you wonder what exactly brought you to the point at which you're watching this unfold on a tiny screen before you. Other activities involve walking. I'm not sure why I made it sound like I was going to list other verbs because that's really the extent of the activities in the game. Skateboarding and walking. There is a sort of weird RPG system that also mainly involves walking, but you're differently walking, so I think you'll agree that they deserve full marks for variety. If you're interested in tracking down a copy of this game, do be aware that, in addition to the standard V-Smile, Shrek the Third Arthur's School Day Adventure is also compatible with the V-Smile Pocket, V-Smile PC Pal, V-Smile Cyber Pocket, and V-Motion consoles. It is not, I repeat, not compatible with the V-Smile Baby! Trust me, I learned that the hard way, and it ruined my entire Christmas holiday. I was inconsolable. There's a word for Shrek to spell on his skateboard. Number 27. Shrek Forever After 2010. V-Smile. Is this, ultimately, just what life is? Some brief wink of consciousness, and even that brief wink can be divided smaller and smaller. The first few years are a bust, the last few years often are as well. You spend some seemingly endless stretch of time wishing you were older and then spend the rest of your time wishing you were younger. Nothing ever feels right. Everything is either too far away or long gone. Life is a continuous alternation between waiting for the future and longing for the past, and then at some point, it stops. You're remembered for a time by family, by friends, but they pass as well. You live on as a memory, and then as a name in documents nobody will ever 
nothing to read. Names beyond number are lost to history. Kings and conquerors who seemed guaranteed to endure might now merit a mention in a footnote in a textbook somewhere. What impact can we possibly have? Perhaps we make others happy, perhaps we don't. Does it matter in the end? Do corpses smile? Or does every story ultimately end the same way? Heroes and villains, have and have not, friends and foes all return to the earth, all are swallowed again by the world that they never had a hope of understanding to begin with. We get a few decades each, if we're lucky. Just enough time to become aware of all of the things that we will never understand. Just enough time to wish we had a little more time. But for what? So we can play another Shrek Edutainment game? Why not? It may not matter, but in the end, what does? Peter? Number 26, Shrek and Roll, 2007, Xbox 360. God, the Xbox Live Arcade was great, wasn't it? Braid, Limbo, Super Meat Boy, Castle Crashers, Geometry Wars Retro Evolved 2, Pac-Man Championship Edition. I could talk all day about the great stuff on Xbox Live Arcade and never have to acknowledge the existence of Shrek and Roll, which sat on the service like a man eating raw fish on the bus when you're too polite to move. The game is... Well, you've seen minigame collections, right? This is that, but without the collection, actually. It's just one minigame, and it's not a particularly good one. You control two characters, one with each thumbstick. In that way, it's like Brothers A Tale Of Two Sons. But here you can only wish that one of them would die. You gradually raise or lower either end of a plank, I think, so that you can feed pumpkins to Shrek's kids. Do Shrek's kids eat pumpkins? I don't remember, I don't know, and I don't care. How many kids did Shrek have? Going by this game, I'm going to say hundreds of millions. Again, I don't remember, I don't know, and I don't care. You roll pumpkins into the mouths of the hideous children until the game has determined that it's time to roll different pumpkins into the mouths of different hideous children. The ogre babies pop into and out of existence through what seem to be time holes, or perhaps portals to the Shrek cinematic multiverse, who's to say? After a little while, Shrek dances and I haven't had to make a single joke in this entry because, really, where does one go from here? There is multiplayer support, but you can simulate the outcome by not making any friends to begin with. Either way, you wind up sad and alone. Number 25, Puss in Boots, 2011, DS. Is it too much of a stretch to include Puss in Boots games on this list? Well, I suppose it's too much of a stretch to include this Puss in Boots game on this list, but we stand behind our decision to include the two games based on the Shrek spin-off film. This one is probably some kind of silly adventure, but you'll usually be watching the bottom screen, so it doesn't really matter. You'll complete levels by doing what most low-effort DS games had you do, tapping, dragging, and flicking the touchscreen. Much of Puss in Boots is presented like a rhythm game, but you'll also come across stylus heavy sequences that have nothing to do with rhythm and everything to do with disguising the fact that there's very little game at all here. Critics complained of unclear objectives and mechanics, as well as shallow gameplay, and we have to agree. Frankly, it's more fun to navigate through a PowerPoint presentation. As an aside, it doesn't qualify for our list as it's a mobile game, but we might as well mention Fruit Ninja Puss in Boots, as it was actually quite fun. That's probably due more to the Fruit Ninja half of the equation than the Puss in Boots half, let's be honest, but it apparently added some new modes that took specific advantage of the character. I say apparently because the game is no longer available for download and obviously can't be purchased physically either. Like so many mobile games, it came and went and is never coming back. If you ever wondered why we include mobile games so infrequently on these lists, that's why. The industry treats their own games as disposable, so why wouldn't we? Number 24, Shrek Treasure Hunt, 2002, PlayStation. Shrek Treasure Hunt is structured like a party game, with characters collecting various items and playing minigames along the way. But as with Fairy Tale Freakdown, the developers neglected to include any kind of multiplayer. That's even less excusable on the PlayStation, which had another controller port right there! The idea is that Princess Fiona is coming over for a picnic, but all of the food has been spread around the swamp, somehow. Now, word of warning, if that ever happens to you in real life, 
purchase new food rather than trying to retrieve it. Seeing who could gather more food in each area will probably be a good way to compete against another player. After you collect enough of it, you get to play a minigame, and that would also be a good way to compete against another player. I now remind you, you are forever alone in Shrek Treasure Hunt, and you'll begin to understand just how pointless the game feels. Actually, Treasure Hunt is a bit of a misnomer as well, since you're seeking out picnic goods rather than treasure. And it certainly does look like Shrek was planning on eating an awful lot of cheese. Not that I'm judging the guy, but, you know, moderation, man. The game looks like it was built by a shivering child learning paper craft. Of course, it's not entirely fair to pick on an early PlayStation game for looking primitive, so allow me to emphasize then that the PS1 came out in 1994 and Shrek Treasure Hunt came out in 2002. Pick on it. Do pick on it. Mistreat it until there is nothing left. Number 23. Shrek Smash and Crash Racing. 2006 Game Boy Advance. The main versions of Shrek Smash and Crash Racing have a more familiar behind the cart perspective, but this one goes with a top down view. That makes complete sense, as the traditional perspective simply wouldn't work on hardware as limited as the Game Boy Advance. Except when Mario Kart was able to do it five years earlier. And when Shrek himself was able to do it four years earlier. <laughs> Whoops. In fairness though, there's nothing inherently wrong with a top-down perspective. Early racing games such as Micro Machines and RC Pro-Am made good use of it. But here, there's not enough room on the screen to see what's coming, what is on the screen isn't clear enough to pass, and the turn indicators show up far too late to be of much use. What's more, there's no multiplayer, which is something else that Shrek Swamp Cart Speedway managed to have four years prior. For many of these games, the developers counted on the simple appeal of seeing Shrek in a video game. That's not a trick you should rely on working 36 times, but that's the way this particular cookie has crumbled, and we all have to live with it. Also, since we're on the subject of a handheld Shrek kart racer, Shrek Kart is another handheld Shrek kart racer, and our writer has been dancing continuously since he learned it was a mobile phone game, and he therefore didn't have to play it for this list. Ah, oh, it's the little things in life sometimes, isn't it? Number 22, Shrek Forever After, 2010, DS, PlayStation 3, Wii, Xbox 360, and PC. Remember Shrek Forever After? Oh, that's okay, I've seen it, and I don't remember it either, but historical records suggest that it does indeed exist, and that it featured Rumpelstiltskin doing the thing for which he was most famous, allowing an ogre to relive his youth for a day. Right? I suppose I don't really remember Rumpelstiltskin very well, either. Anyway, it was the fourth movie in a trilogy, so I think we know exactly how much it needed to exist. Still, we're here to talk about the game. It takes a few cues from Shrek 2, in the sense that you switch between characters to overcome various obstacles, but it wisely doesn't bother with AI companions. It also doesn't bother with doing anything interesting, as you'll Shrek smash and crash your way through drab environment after drab environment, likely becoming bored early and never being given a reason to stick with it. The game controls just fine, probably even a little bit better than Shrek 2 did, but the visuals are far less colourful and the entire experience feels like you're just going through the motions. The DS version is not quite the same game, but it's an admirable attempt to convey the overall experience on a handheld. And by that I mean, you still walk around hitting things and wishing you died in your sleep. We're including it in this entry because it's neither significantly worse nor better than the main game, and if I had to talk about it for a full entry on its own, I would disappear into a cloud of pure boredom. Number 21. Shrek – The Electronic Storybook Collection 2001 – PC there's precious little information about Shrek the Electronic Storybook Collection floating about. Nobody seems to have reviewed it on any of the major gaming sites, nor have they even reviewed it on Amazon. Three people did assign it star ratings, but they didn't put any of their thoughts into actual words. Perhaps they had no thoughts. Perhaps Shrek the Electronic Storybook Collection left them speechless. Perhaps there was just 
nothing to say? Which is preposterous, because I'm talking about it right now. The main attraction is a storybook retelling of the first Shrek film, with the sound effects ripped right from the movie. It's a bit like one of those books you had as a kid, where you'd push the picture of the frog and it would oink at you. Actually, I think my book might have been defective thinking about it. Other features included Shrek Tell Your Own Tale, which is a choose your own adventure story, which if you don't know, well, you can probably work out what a choose your own adventure story is just from the name. It came in two versions, one that ran right off the disc, and another that would arrive in small installments in your email. I'm sure the servers for that have long since been put out of their misery, but we can only imagine that getting regular life update emails from Shrek himself was the nearest thing most of humanity could ever experience to hell on Earth. You could even print out 60 Shrek-related images to colour in. Very handy if you had a surplus of green, grey and brown crayons. Less handy, though, if you had literally any others. Number 20. Shrek Gameland Activity Center, 2001, PC. It must be quite easy to develop something like Shrek Game Land Activity Center, a title in which all of the words sit next to each other, but sort of refuse to form into a larger thought. The package consists of seven different games, none of which really have anything to do with Shrek. The game does attempt to provide narrative justification, weirdly enough. When you begin the Word Find game, you're told that Lord Farquaad has outlawed certain words, and it's your job to find them. One would think that if these words were outlawed, you probably shouldn't be finding them and presenting them to his highness, but the fact that they even tried to apply a backstory to a word search is almost admirable. Most of these are games you might find on a child's placemat in a restaurant. There's a maze, there's a crossword puzzle without any clues, which calls its legitimacy as a puzzle into question. But there are a few games that are a bit more involved, such as a picture puzzle, matching the melody, and smashing the like button. Sma smashing the bugs, sorry, smashing the bugs. In fact, you could probably play smashing the bugs on a placemat as well, just depending on the quality of the restaurant. There's no real fun to be had here, and that's not just because we're not the target audience. This would keep children occupied for around seven minutes maximum, which breaks down as one minute to boot up each game, recognize it as something they hate, and promise God above never to boot it up again. Even fans of the movies will be underserved, as they'd get more Shrek content from Google Images. Do keep Safe Search switched on, however, I absolutely implore you. Number 19. Shrek 2 Activity Center Twisted Fairy Tale Fun 2004 PC or as I like to call it, Shrek, too activity, too centred. Twisted Fairy Tale Fun does accurately describe much of the appeal of the Shrek films, but it's something that's shockingly often absent from the video games. We get some fairy tale set dressing, but they lack the twist that makes things feel clever. The games here are better than those in the previous Activity Center, but they lack any kind of inventiveness. In one, you have to eat the same food that King Harold eats. What's the twist there? In another, you have to click on things that are the same color as Shrek. What's the twist there? In another, you're just putting things into a blender so Fiona can make smoothies. But what's the twist there? In this one, the three little pigs catch baking ingredients in a bowl. What's the twist there? Apart from their tails. <laughs> <laughs> really though, are these twisted fairy tales, or are they just sort of bland? One game involves clicking on Puss in Boots when he pops up from behind things, and oh no, that's it, that's the game. Not only is there no twist, but they didn't even have the good sense to turn the cursor into crosshairs or something. Instead, it ends up feeling like a find the object game in which there's only one object on the screen. These games so frustratingly miss the mark. There's endless room for creativity when putting age-old fairy tales through the ringer. All that these developers can think to do, though, is plop Shrek into an existing framework and collect a check. Twisted Fairy Tale Fun isn't the worst game on this list, but it might be the one that most clearly illustrates the problem with the entire world of Shrek video games. Number 18, Shrek 2, 2004, PC. The console version of Shrek 2 was ported to PCs, but developer No Wonder took one look at that pile of crap and thought, <laughs> we can also produce crap. Hence the confusingly named Shrek 2 for PC, which isn't the PC port of Shrek 2. 
So what is it? It's just a 3D platformer, really. The other Shrek 2 is a sort of overhead brawler, but this has a much simpler, much more straightforward approach, which is good. Everything other than the approach, though, is less good. 3D platformers live and die on their ability to, like, allow you to platform in 3D. Is that obvious? I feel like that should be obvious, but nobody bothered to tell the developer. It has slippery physics, laggy controls, and a camera that seems to trick you into thinking that objects are both closer and farther away than they should be. It's a platformer that is raw hell out of the gate, and only gets worse from there. I admit, I know that PC games can be a bit of a crapshoot. It's possible that our writer's system and settings made Shrek 2 behave in ways that it shouldn't have, but reviewers at the time felt no kinder towards it than we feel today, and even if it did function flawlessly, it's still a rather bare-bones mascot platformer with little to recommend it. There are a few switch puzzles and combat sequences to break up the gameplay, but that's only if doing one thing that doesn't work between two other things that don't work qualifies as breaking up the gameplay. I'm not sure. Number 17. Shrek Swamp Cart Speedway 2002 Game Boy Advance Right, it's a kart racer starring Shrek on the Game Boy Advance. How good do you think it's going to be? Now let's say one thing right up front, this is pretty clearly a rip-off of Mario Kart Super Circuit, right? I mean, it certainly has the same looks impressive and terrible at the same time sort of vibe. But Mario Kart Super Circuit came out in 2001, just one year earlier. Shrek Swamp Kart Speedway, therefore, had a pretty quick turnaround. So either the developers worked very efficiently to rip that game off, or they just never saw their families. Considering the ultimate quality of Shrek Swamp Cart Speedway, I sure hope it was the former. We'll give it a bit of credit, though. A racer with a 3D perspective on such limited hardware deserves at least some praise. They even added multiplayer, which is something most Shrek games that needed it were bizarrely reluctant to include. Plus, there are a fair number of tracks and races. All of that sounds good, right? Then you actually play the game and realize it controls like a bathtub full of mud. The tracks range from uneventful to overloaded with difficult to see hazards and impossibly sharp turns. Your cart behaves erratically, sometimes being lurched ahead without a clear reason, and other times coming to a dead halt just from brushing against a wall. And the soundtrack is sometimes indistinguishable from one of those novelty records of dogs barking Christmas carols. Playing Shrek Swamp Cart Speedway is less like trying to navigate a racetrack, and more like trying to force your own head to explode through sheer force of will. Number 16, I'm feeling better now. Shrek Super Slam 2005 DS If the nicest thing anyone can say about the DS version of Shrek Super Slam is that it's better than the GBA version of Shrek Super Slam, then that's really disappointing. Still, it is worth saying that it's better than the GBA version, because that game was the closest thing to your Game Boy Advance being able to fart. This one, at least, is capable of providing some actual fun to actual human beings, and that is, sadly, noteworthy in itself. This version retains the three-dimensional arenas of the console version, though they clearly aren't as impressive. Neither, of course, are the characters models, but that's all to be expected. What's less expected is how well the basic experience translates to a handheld. You can still have up to four players, though there's no download play option, meaning you'll either need four copies of the game or make do with CPU opponents. Many reviewers took issue with the game's use of the touchscreen, which is where you select items. Taking your attention away from the main screen in order to equip a weapon is inconvenient, but it also adds a nice layer of strategizing. You can look away during the fracas if you're particularly daring, but otherwise you'll want to put some distance between yourself and your opponents beforehand, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. What is a bad thing is the fact that the camera control is handled through the touchscreen as well, and when you're stuck behind a wall or unable to see what's going on, shifting your attention to a different screen to resolve that problem feels like adding insult to injury. Number 15. Shrek the Third, 2007. Game Boy Advance. The GBA version of Shrek the Third is about what we'd expect for from any lazy licensed tie-in. In other words, this is the baseline expectation of competence that any gamer should expect from what they buy. That makes the fact that it's this far up the list an absolute embarrassment. It follows the plot of the film, which is about Shrek walking from left to right and punching birds out of the sky. It's precisely the sort of 2D platformer in which any character could star with only minor alterations, and that's okay. What's not okay is that this somehow qualifies as a standout Shrek game. 
It would be nice if things were a little clearer, as it's nearly impossible to discern what you're looking at if you have an early version of the handheld without the backlit screen, but that's less of a concern nowadays when you can play it on your DS, or even better, not play it at all. The soundtrack is also pretty darned good, being about the only element of the game that exceeds our expectations. It iterates on the ideas introduced by the Shrek 2 GBA game, with many levels involving you switching between characters and solving puzzles with their special abilities. Overall though, Shrek the Third is at its best when it's just Shrek bare knuckle boxing his way through things, and even then, its best is not that great. Number 14. Shrek the Third: The Search for Arthur, 2007. The Flash. Who could have guessed that the best Shrek edutainment game would have been the least educational one? Oh, everybody. Yeah, well, I suppose that is quite obvious now that I think about it. Here, the educational content is squirreled away in a knowledge world area, as though the developers didn't want it to distract from the fact that they made an actual game this time. And that really is for the best. The main games are meant to teach children about basic counting, pattern recognition, and logical puzzle solving, but those are things that just about any game can teach, edutainment or otherwise. As such, the search for Arthur just gets to focus on being a collection of decent mini-games. That's fine and fine in this case represents a significant step forwards. The games themselves work well enough, but I'd never, under any circumstances, recommend seeking this one out, not even in an emergency. You'll move boxes around, ride a horse, catch falling fruit, you know, standard we didn't know what to make but we had to make something stuff. There's also a 3D platforming area, which isn't half bad. Actually, I just checked my maths, turns out it is exactly half bad. Still. Progress is progress. There's even a stealth section involving Fiona, which is, again, only exactly half bad. I will say that this game looks great for the V-Flash. It could even pass for an early PS2 game if you ever had a compelling enough reason to try to convince anyone that Shrek the Third, The Search for Arthur, were a PS2 game. Number 13. Shrek Super Party, 2002. GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Xbox. The plot of Shrek Super Party is that horrific sentient bobblehead dolls of the Shrek cast are competing to find out which horrific sentient bobblehead doll can win the largest amount of terrible mini-games. Actually, that's not entirely true. The winner is determined based on a sort of matching puzzle between rounds in which the players swap bugs with each other to decide who ends up with the most drops of bug juice, which sounds ridiculous, but... Um, Never mind, there's no way I can convince any of you that it's not ridiculous. However, it does add some room for strategizing, which is missing from many party games. The downside is that you'll be spending your time honing strategies for bug-matching sequences in Shrek Super Party. But what of the mini-games? Well, I don't even need to tell you about them. Close your eyes for about five seconds and think of the lowest effort mini-games you'd cram into something called Shrek Super Party. Now, open your eyes and surprise, here they all are. Critics took issue with a confusing movement system, instructions that don't make anything clear, and the fact that Shrek Super Party was a massive pile of steaming plops. Scuttlebutt suggests that developer Mass Media reused aspects of Shrek Super Party for Muppets Party Cruise, which they released the following year. Is this true? I don't know because we haven't yet ranked all of the Muppets games. Nor have we ranked any of the games that take place on party cruises. And please, don't ask us to do either of those things. Number 12. Shrek the Third, 2007. PlayStation 2, PlayStation Portable, Wii, Xbox 360, and PC. Shrek the Third, or um, Shrek the Threeth, is a 3D platformer that is much better than it has any right to be. It's repetitive and linear to a fault, with very little variation or reason to explore, but it honestly doesn't look bad and it plays just fine. It also tries to keep things interesting. It has six different characters, each with their own attacks and special moves. There are even secrets and easter eggs to find if you're truly dedicated to exploring every inch of Shrek the Third. And that's all good, but the core experience rarely deviates from fighting a horde of baddies, shuffling onward, and fighting the next horde of baddies. We've played far worse games, even just today, but Shrek the Third feels so limited and hollow. The character variety is nice, but none of them are around long enough to really shine. The combat is serviceable, but it feels shallow and sluggish. The game seems to have a fair number of enemy types, but you'll very quickly encounter them often enough that you get sick of them, and tragically, even more sick of pummeling them within an inch of their lives. There's a perfectly fine licensed game here, but it seems like the developers didn't try to provide any more than the bare minimum. Improving anything would have made all the difference. Instead, we're left with something as forgettable and inessential as the film itself. Actually, when you think about it, that makes it a great adaptation! Number 11. Shrek's Carnival Craze Party Games, 2008. 
3DS, PlayStation 2, Wii, and PC. I'll give you one guess as to what you think Shrek's Carnival Craze Party Games is. Did you guess a party game? If so, you're correct. Did you guess an assortment of carnival games? If so, you are also correct. Did you guess a Shrek Toydvania? Well, in that case, you are not correct, but mad props to the pun, my dude. Shrek's Carnival Craze Party Games contains about 30 multiplayer games split across several worlds. There's a loose narrative, the loosest possible narrative, in which Shrek goes to the carnival and I suppose that's it, really. Shrek goes to the carnival, and then he either does or does not play some carnival games, depending on the character you choose. On the bright side, you can play with up to three friends, which provides some amusement. That amusement extends to realising you and three friends are playing Shrek's Carnival Craze Party games, but it's something. For all the single players, all the single players, all the single players, all the single players, right, that's enough. For all the single players, there's very little to enjoy here, but that's to be expected. The games are simple score attacks, timing challenges, or races, basically the sort of thing you'd get from the laziest edition of Mario Party if Mario were green and flatulent. I can't say I'm a big fan, but if you liked it, then you should have tossed a ring on it. Oh, that's right, bringing the joke back around for a grand slam. You're welcome. You're all welcome. Number 10. Shrek 2, 2004. Game Boy Advance. A peek behind the curtain, dear viewer, we hadn't played most of these games before. In fact, if we had any idea we'd have to rank so many edutainment games, we wouldn't have committed to this in the first place. And so, when we were researching games, this one stood out, because several outlets, including Wikipedia, compared it to Donkey Kong Country. That sounds like a winner. Maybe he'd collect onions instead of bananas if they wanted to get really creative. But whoever made those comparisons must not have played Donkey Kong Country. This is far closer to something like The Lost Vikings, as you manage a handful of characters with different abilities to help you navigate puzzle-like stages. Shrek is powerful and can lift heavy items, but he's slow. Donkey can kick down walls, but is weaker. Jinji is the weakest, but has the highest jump and a projectile. Puss in Boots can scale walls, Human Shrek gets a sword, and probably a significant reduction in foot odor. It's a perfectly good concept, but the amount of trial and error required to work out exactly where each character needs to be, and when, and what they need to do, gets boring fast. It's probably best in small doses, but then I'd be recommending you keep coming back to Shrek 2, and I don't think I can do that in good conscience. It's far from a total misfire, but after a few levels, you're bound to feel like the developers are wasting your time. And you're probably right. Number 9. Shrek 2 Beg for Mercy 2004 Game Boy Advance I'm sure you'd probably be grateful that we stopped talking about that previous game if I didn't have to start talking about it again for this entry. Shrek 2 Beg for Mercy reuses many of the assets from Shrek 2, with the twist that it focuses entirely on Puss in Boots. The problem with the previous game is not that it was bad, but rather that it was tedious. Restricting players to Puss in Boots for most of this game, then, allows them to get more familiar with him and to focus on smaller, clearer objectives that don't involve moving characters around like chess pieces. If what you enjoyed about the previous game was its focus on multi-character puzzles, then you'll certainly rank this one lower. You'll also rank this one lower if you're judging it by its cutscenes, which I'm about 90% sure were actually made with Microsoft Paint. Looks to me like they should be trying to get their money back from whoever they hired through Fiverr. And you'll also rank this one lower if you're going by the soundtrack alone, as the previous game had some decent chiptune jams, while this one has, well, I suppose it's technically music, but it's nothing you should knowingly put in your ears. Actually, you know what, if you want to rank it lower for those reasons, or any other reasons, you go for it. You will not even need to explain yourself. I'm not going to argue with you, I just like the funny cat, okay? Number 8. Shrek Smash and Crash Racing 2006 DS, GameCube, PlayStation 2, and PlayStation Portable Shrek Smash and Crash Racing is another kart racer. All cartoon characters are obligated to star in at least three of them, after all, and it's... Oh, a competent one. Now, it isn't good, but when the words Shrek, Kart, and Racer are arranged in that sequence, expectations aren't sky high. A number of reviewers criticised it for control issues, but others had no problem steering Shrek and Co. around at all, so it's possible that the learning curve was just slightly too steep for what people expect from the genre. A fair criticism, but not necessarily an indictment. The game opens with a snail being turned against its will into a monster monstrous basilisk, after which Shrek mounts it and everyone starts racing in circles. The tracks are varied and they look nice, but there's only 12 of them, each of which gets a mirror mode variation. 
They have alternate paths and shortcuts to find, which makes things more interesting as you're learning them, but once you do, there's never really a reason to not take the shortcut again, meaning you'll still be taking one path through each area every time. The lack of a minimap also makes things more difficult than they should be, really. The DS version does have a minimap, though, on the bottom screen, and that version is close enough to the main game that we're including it here. However, it simplifies the tracks, horribilizes the music, and also makes all of the races look like origami. But, you know, it is the same game, so if you ever wanted to take this on the go, well, I, I can't legally stop you, is all I'm saying. Number 7. Shrek 2 2004, GameCube, PlayStation 2, Xbox, and PC. Released for the PC is Shrek 2 colon Team Action, presumably to distinguish it from the differently terrible PC game called Shrek 2. This game finds Shrek shambling around empty environments with three companions who follow closely enough behind him that they're in danger of being mistaken for warts on his beautiful green cheeks. You are always stuck with a team, though at least in multiplayer you'll have someone to absorb your verbal abuse. In single player, you'll just have to hurl it at your cold, unfeeling television screen screen that you can't even reduce to tears, so what's the point? But what actually is this game? Well, if you play with the AI, it's an extended, frustrating exercise in trying to get your companions unstuck from the scenery. If you play with friends, it's also that, only now they're just doing it to annoy you on purpose. It's ostensibly about Shrek and Fiona taking a trip together, but really it's a bunch of beat-em-up maps broken up by escort missions or mini-games. The multiplayer is nice to have, but the cluster of characters that you have to steer through the game gets irritating quickly. They do each have special abilities, but none of them are things that Shrek couldn't have unlocked himself. A simplified and refined version of this game could be fun and offer decent variety, but instead it's overstuffed and undercooked, as though it were more important to tout a litany of features on the back of the box than it was to provide even one thing within the game that was actually satisfying to experience. Number 6. Shrek 2001 Xbox Shrek, serving as an Xbox launch title, probably seemed like a match made in heaven. Shrek was green, and the Xbox was, well, grey, but it had some green on it. Okay, maybe the similarities ended there, but in North America at least, this was one of 22 launch titles for the platform. This, what you're looking at, was one of the launch titles for the first console from a new manufacturer. It's frankly a miracle that Microsoft is still around today. Typically, a launch game serves as a showcase for a console console's features or processing power. Shrek seemed to serve as a showcase for the Xbox's ability to run games that nobody bothered to finish making. Loose controls, poor collision, and level design that might have been passable in an early beta mar what could have been a decent 3D platformer. And Shrek had a chance to become a decent 3D platformer with Shrek Extra Large, a 2002 GameCube port that aimed to refine this gameplay. It had every opportunity to share its embarrassment embarrassing 49% on Metacritic. Did it work? Well, it did indeed score differently, so yes. Developer DICE, wait hang on, DICE? Good lord. Developer DICE was at least clever enough to steal from the best. The entire game is structured like Super Mario 64, with Shrek travelling to various worlds to select and complete objectives from a list. The difference is that whereas Nintendo slaved over the development of Super Mario 64 to ensure that everything, right down to the mere act of moving Mario around, was satisfying, DICE simply made sure that Shrek had been written on the box and then called it a day. And speaking of that box, it looks like somebody whipped it up as a joke. It really is difficult at times to tell genuine official Shrek content apart from low effort Shrek memes. Maybe this is the game that kicked off that trend, who's to say? I only wish that it instead kicked me to death. Number 5. Shrek Hassle at the Castle 2002 Game Boy Advance is this the laziest game title possible? A noun that just rhymes with a setting? That takes no effort whatsoever. And even then, it only works when you're from the north. If Ben said it, it would be Shrek Hassle at the Castle. Anyway, here are some more ideas that the writer came up with in 18 seconds that are just as good. Shrek Romp in the Swamp. Shrek Fungeon in the Dungeon. Shrek Weirdness at... 
Oh, he's put weirdness at Inverness. Okay, admittedly, it must be harder than it seems. My apologies. Wikipedia describes this game as the only Shrek title that follows the plot of the first movie. Which is true, as long as you disregard the other games we've already talked about that have done exactly that. Also, following the plot of the film was clearly not high on the developer's list of intentions. It's a brawler in which Shrek walks forward, snapping the spines of every person he meets. You know, just like in the movie. Uh, the game does pay some small degree of lip service to the film by retelling many of its plot beats in simple static images, but the rest of the time you, Donkey and Fiona just walk around, injure people until they beg for their lives, and refuse to heed their pleas. It's competent, if massively unengaging. Most of the levels seem to have been designed by someone whose greatest skill was drawing a single horizontal line, which means that boredom sets in very quickly. But if you're really just looking for a game in which you can hit people with Shrek's fists, well, this one does actually work. It's never fun, it's often annoying, players have been known to fall into comas while playing it, but it does work. And when it comes to Shrek games, that's a glowing recommendation. Number 4. Shrek Reekin Havoc, 2003, Game Boy Advance. Oh, my mistake, this is Harsel at the Castle again, isn't it? Has the editor used the wrong footage, or is this basically the same game released a second time? Okay, I'll drop the joke, because I record my voiceover long before Alex actually edits the video. In fact, I have no way of knowing what is on screen right now. For all I know, it's a caption making some hilarious joke at the expense of my integrity as a human being. Good. Are we done with that? Great. Okay. Well, I'll tell you now that Wreaking Havoc is indeed very similar to the previous game, but it introduces more variety and requires some actual exploration. Yes, most areas are still just horizontal lines, but now you have to explore those lines. <laughs> huge difference. The plot picks up where Hazel at the Castle left off, which I suppose technically makes Reekin Havoc a sequel to the film as well. By some accounts though, it's an adaptation of the 2003 ride Shrek 4D The Ghost of Lord Farquaad. I have no idea if that's actually true though. I'll play Shrek video games for you, but I draw the line at visiting Shrek theme park attractions. Also, I might as well talk about this here. You'd think, as a character who was entirely computer generated from the get-go, Shrek would look good in video games. Usually though, he rarely comes out as anything more than a hideous green blob. I mean, an even more hideous green blob. This pair of games though, at least attempted something new with the character designs, and they do look a little better. That doesn't say much though, given that the games look a lot better when they're sitting harmlessly in a box on a shelf far from your home. Number 3. Shrek the Third, 2007, DS. Against all odds, the DS version of Shrek the Third is the best one. It manages to work better than both most Shrek games and most licensed DS games in general by crafting an experience that is specific to the hardware and which benefits from it, rather than one that is held back by it or reliant upon its gimmickry. From the opening sequence, which requires players to hold the system like an actual storybook, it's clear that someone involved with development actually cared about what they were doing. This extends to level design, where the dual screen layout is used to provide some welcome verticality, and to gameplay, where the touchscreen is used for swapping characters and other actions. It's a distressingly rare experience when playing a slew of Shrek games to come to the conclusion that anyone involved in any given one knew what they were doing when they made it. But here we are. As in some of the GBA games, players will encounter puzzles that require cooperation of multiple characters to solve. Here however, they feel more natural and don't grind the experience to a halt. They're just one part of what is overall a fun and charming adventure full of excellent music, great visuals, and a decent amount of replay value with its hidden collectibles. Is it worth seeking out if you're not already interested in Shrek games? Oh, absolutely not. But if you are, it is worth picking up. You can have fun with some games on this list, for sure, but this is one of the few that feels like it's having fun too. Number 2. Puss in Boots 2011 PlayStation 3, Wii, and Xbox 360 We can all agree that while the Shrek sequels are 
well, sequels to Shrek, one fairly consistent highlight is Puss in Boots, played adorably by Antonio Banderas. Therefore, we maybe shouldn't be surprised that an entire game focused on the character would work so well. Even so, we are surprised, because you've seen the absolute Shrek Drek we've had to wade through to get to this point. What's more, versions of this game were made with motion controls in mind, and miraculously, they worked. Admittedly, our writer hasn't played this on the Kinect, and I think you'd sooner find him dead and cold in the ground, but the critics who had played it using that notoriously awful peripheral actually had good things to say. It helps, of course, that Puss in Boots is an extremely basic game, meaning the Kinect can get away with a lack of immediate responsiveness, and players can focus on the simple gameplay instead. The adventure cycles between stealth sequences, swashbuckling, and, uh, dance battles. Or should I say dance cattles? Uh, no, I shouldn't actually, because cattle is a different word entirely. The game, like the film on which it's based, follows the lovable swordsman through his pre-Shrek adventures. Coincidentally, I also mentally divide my life between pre-Shrek adventures and post-Shrek adventures. Reviewers praised it for its creativity and family-friendly approach to the material, and aside from its short length, they really didn't have much to complain about. So yeah, a motion-controlled video game based on a Shrek spin-off was actually good and got a number two spot in a worst-to-best list. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Oh, come on. It wasn't a great pun, I admit, but you don't have to be rude about it. I Okay, I'm really sorry. Uh, ben, you better take over for a second. Number one. Shrek Super Slam 2005. GameCube, PlayStation 2, Xbox, and PC. At the end of this list of cheap, pandering Shrek games, isn't it nice to finally talk about one that's truly great? I wouldn't know, because I'm stuck talking about Shrek Super Slam. What makes it stand out, unfortunately, is that it's indeed good for what it is, as opposed to a tangle of limp ideas or missed potential. Reviewers at the time compared it to classics such as Super Smash Bros and Power Stone, and it pales in comparison to those, obviously. It's not wrong to acknowledge the obvious templates that inspired Shrek Super Slam, but taken on its own merits, it's a perfectly competent fighter of its own. It isn't surprising at all that it's the one Shrek game that has garnered any kind of following that isn't also firmly ironic. There are even Shrek Super Slam tournaments, which, yes, almost certainly started as a joke, but they continued right through 2021 and are as likely as ever to keep going from there. It even continues to get fan-made mods and texture upgrades, which reflects a level of ongoing engagement that other Shrek games simply don't have. And, you know, that's good. The fact is, there's actual quality in Shrek Super Slam, keeping it from falling into a realm composed exclusively of memes and derision. Yes, Shrek and pals beating each other up is an inherently silly concept, but there is actual fun to be had here, with great presentation, a good soundtrack, and the kind of mindless entertainment that makes for a fine party game. It's still not especially good, but it's admirably far from bad. So yes, that's where we end the conversation on Shrek. When the best game on this list was already, and not unjustly, featured on a show called Worst Games Ever, you know this was an experience that we're happy to come to an end. Then again, based on what we've seen here today, we've got at least another 33 appearances of Shrek games on Worst Games Ever to come. I suppose it's not Ogre yet. Yep, that's it. That's the end of the video.